Welcome to another episode of Speaker Sponsor, where we bring you the people behind the scenes of the speaking industry, the meeting planners, the speakers bureaus, the managers, the agents, and the experts who have the inside scoop to help you educate, motivate, and inspire as a public speaker. And without further ado, here's your host, Julie Austin. Hi, and welcome to Speaker Sponsor, the show for the entrepreneurial speaker. My name is Julie Austin, and I'll be your host today. You know, um, as a speaker, we tend to only see one little piece of an event, but the meeting planner has to plan everything from the venue and the catering, everything in between. Our next guest has been on both sides, so she's going to have a unique view of how things work on, on both sides so that the speaker and meeting planner can work together for the benefit of the audience. So here's a little bit about her background. She is a certified meetings manager with almost three decades of experience working as a planner for corporations and associations. She's hired speakers like Margaret Thatcher and Barbara Bush, along with many subject matters in the field of leadership, the economy, and everything in between. In 2008, Tamara Gaines was given her first opportunity to present to a group of five thousand people and she caught the speaking bug uh, and she developed a book and a message around confidence through her work history she's been able to speak facilitate and MC, further developing her passion for the personal and professional development of others she's recently become a certified professional coach and has launched her own business coaching speaking and consulting to help others achieve their goals with confidence. Welcome to the show, Tamara. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm so glad we got to do this in person. I knew. Because I think doing business face-to-face is way better. Absolutely. Virtual stuff. Absolutely. It serves its purpose. There's a time and there's a place, but the interaction is definitely invaluable. Yes. Well, um, as somebody who comes from a TV and film background, so I've been an actor begging for work. (laughs) And on the casting end, hiring people and working as development in development and distribution. So there were things that I wish I could tell actors. I'm guessing there's a lot of things that you would like to tell speakers being on the other side, right? Absolutely. Um, you book some impressive speakers. And um, I'm just wondering, do you work solely with speaker bureaus because i know a lot of celebrities uh, are in the speaker bureaus but for for everyone else is there a chance for a new up-and-coming emerging speaker to get in the door yes and um i learned a long time ago the value of working with a speaker's bureau and i'll tell you a couple stories here in a minute but to answer the question about can people get their foot in the door Yes, and it's a little bit tough to do that. You know, being connected with a bureau certainly has its advantages. Um, when when a planner reaches out, oftentimes we're looking for a variety of speakers or we want multiple options. And so if we're having to be the one to reach out to everyone individually, it's very time consuming with everything else that, that planners have on their plate as well. Um, I have booked speakers direct, but many times am am utilizing a bureau. Um, I told you I learned my lesson years ago in that. I had two instances that come to mind right now. Um, One of them was two days before Tipper Gore was going to be speaking for us. Her mother had passed away. You know, unexpected, no way to prepare for that on, on their end. But because we had worked with a speakers bureau, they were the ones that, as we were literally on site moving in for our show, they were the ones that were doing all the legwork to make the replacement for us. And then in two days, in two days. And then the (laughs) the other instance was we had booked George Stephanopoulos and he had signed his agreement with Good Morning America, I want to say two or three weeks prior to our show. So we had a little bit more notice, but. 30, 45 days prior to a big conference, you're in the thick of things. So again, the Bureau was a big help in that as well. And they do the vetting and they do a lot of the, you know, the contract. And when you work with the, you know, one or two bureaus, you're you're used to 
what that agreement looks like and you're able to build a cadence with that, which is nice as well. So as you can tell, I'm a fan of the Bureau, but it doesn't mean that there aren't that planners. There are opportunity Absolutely. for speakers to get in. Absolutely. Some, somehow, yeah. that door, through the chimney. Um, <laughs> um, what do you specifically look for in a speaker? You know, I think it, um, it really depends. I've kind of two avenues working mostly over, over the years through an association. You know, I've got main stage speakers that I'm trying to book that tends to be for a broader audience. And then, you know, breakout sessions or workshops and that sort of thing, which is more subject matter expert. And so it might be a matter of, you know, what's the topic that they're covering, but also really looking at their presence and their delivery. And the best way for a planner to determine that is through a video, sizzle reel. Um, you know, what marketing materials do they provide? And, uh, and then, you know, what are they offering as far as their description and the topics and, and everything that we can use to leverage promoting them in the best way possible. To you, uh, how important are referrals? Because I notice, like in a particular industry, one speaker will do every conference. <laughs> you look at it and they go, they're not giving anyone else a chance. But is that um, because of maybe social proof? So they've already proven themselves in that industry or... Yes, a lot of times. So if you have an industry that say there's a national, you know, component to it, but there's either state associations or even local chapters within a particular state, we're all talking with each other. You know, right. we're all on, you know, social media and sharing and we look for ways to share when someone comes in and does a really great job. We're posting about it. We want that speaker to be speaking within that industry for others. And because we're not working with the same exact audience. You know, someone attending my association event isn't going to be attending the same one that's in California. It's a different audience. So right. this, the same speaker can easily get on that circuit. And, uh, and that word of mouth is very important. And if someone refers a speaker to me and it's someone that I've worked with, the individual who's referring it as someone that I've you know, worked with and highly respect, then, you know, I need less collateral from the speaker because I'll put a lot of weight into that referral. Um, along that same line, uh, what about testimonials? Because, you know, I, I hate always asking for the testimonials. Like, oh, I have 50 of them, but, you know, you constantly have to Absolutely. get more, it seems. No, I think testimonials are right in, right in line with that as well. And I think that's a wonderful thing that if the speakers aren't capturing testimonials to be able to do that. And in this day and age, not only getting them in writing, but Doing a quick video exactly. on site with your phone is another great way to capture a testimonial or at least ask for that video testimonial after the fact. Um, I've done that many times as a planner where it's like, okay, I don't have time right now because the conference is going on, but I will make a note and, and make sure to get them a video testimonial afterward. Well, especially if someone comes up after and says, oh, we love that. Hold on a second. Yeah. <laughs> and you grab their phone. Right? Yeah. That's yeah, audience, the best time. Their audience exciting. feedback is great. Yeah. Um, do you start with a theme when you're planning, or do you get um, you know a call for proposals, and then all of these um, proposals come in, different topics, different speakers, and does that give you ideas? Which one comes first, or do you do both? I would say generally with regard to theming, yes, you know, conferences will generally have a theme, but they pretty much have their objective of what's going to be covered. So a lot of the agendas repeat themselves. If, if you have an annual conference, the shell of the agenda is probably going to repeat itself year over year. I know that on day one, I need one keynote and, you know, five breakout sessions. And day two, the I've got a, agenda. the actual yeah. agenda itself. And, um, you know, so with that, there's a theme. And if you can tie into the theme, then great. You know, one year it was one team, one dream. And, or yeah, one dream, one team, all interchangeable. <laughs> and, you know, we played off of, uh, you know, sports figures coming in and kind of talking about teamwork. Um, but at the same time, if I'm looking for a speaker that's, you know, on 
I need an advocacy speaker. I may not want to actually have political advocacy, but have someone that comes in and talks about how they advocate for something. Maybe it's someone who's advocating for clean water or or what have you. And with that, we can kind of tie into the theme that way. But generally, you know, call for proposals, yes. You know, speakers should be on the lookout for that. Uh, they're generally put out there. If you know a particular conference that you want to get into, go out to the website, look for a speaker RFP. A lot of uh, conferences and planners will have the opportunity for you to fill out your information online. And that's really helpful as well because we do capture that. And when we're, you know, sitting down and trying to figure out how we're going to place everybody within that agenda that we have set, then we're drawing from that list as well. Do you keep those on file? At so we're looking for leadership, communication. Do you have those speakers? Absolutely. And I think um, it probably makes your job a little easier to have one email where everything comes in so that the entire committee and everyone can see it. Am I, am I right? Um, or- I've not worked with a lot of committees, to be completely honest. Um, I, and being in associations, you do have that committee mm-hmm. atmosphere uh, from time to time. And working with the main stage speakers, I'm generally the, you know, booking direct and, and uh, working with a leadership team on, on that. If we have a committee that is needing assistance with booking something for maybe one of their programs or a conference that's a little more dedicated to them, then I generally will kind of select the three speakers that I would want and then have them choose from that. Um, Also look very big picture of how many speakers are we bringing on for a particular event? How much diversity do we have? You know, kind of going, starting with the end in mind, you know, what is the marketing materials going to look like? And how do I make sure work backwards? Yeah, it worked backwards. And how do I make sure that I'm covering a lot of demographics? Because again, I keep tying back to the associations, but associations are member driven organizations. Your corporations have stakeholders too. But how are you meeting the needs of everyone who's in the audience? And so I think that diversity and being mindful of that is really important. Well, you just brought up a good point. So sometimes it has nothing to do with us. You're looking for a female speaker or a male speaker yeah. or whatever diversity you're looking for. You know, yeah. sometimes we just aren't that. <laughs> right. It has nothing to do with us. So we can't take it personally. Oh, definitely should not take it personally because there are there are a lot of speakers in the world. There's a lot of conferences too, but, you know, trying to get connected, right. um, you know, it is a numbers game. And definitely making sure that you're putting your name out there. And I think that's, again, the advantage of the Bureau. But that's also the advantage of developing relationships with other speakers that speak on your topic. You know, so that if if I'm reaching out for someone who speaks on innovation and he or she is not available, then they know someone who they would put their name behind and say, well, here's someone who will also do a really great job for you. And that just really kind of controls the process a lot and makes the planner's world a lot easier. I'm a step ahead of you. I started reaching out to innovation speakers, male innovation speakers that I looked up to, that I yeah. really respected, and just called. And I said, look, you're busy, um, and, you know, you can't do it. Give me a call. Absolutely. And if they're looking for a female or if I'm in the position, they're looking for a male, and I can recommend you. So there, there are definitely ways to work with your competition, yeah. even your direct competition. Absolutely. Absolutely. One person cannot handle all of it. We tend to think we can. I know. <laughs> 300, how many days are there in the year? Okay. <laughs> no, I think uh, we would be spreading ourselves too thin. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it important, more important, for a speaker to be an expert in one topic, or do you tend to look for a good speaker? Now, maybe the expert's not a great speaker, but they're a great expert. And the other person is a great speaker, but they're not necessarily an expert. Which one 
do you tend to lean towards? I, I think you can utilize both. I think if you have an expert in a field who is not a great speaker and you and you know that, then set up for fireside chat and, you know, have a different method of Q&A or something where you're not counting on them to kind of entertain the audience, if you will. But, you know, in the, in the business world of, of hiring people, I always say, you know, hire for the personality because I can teach skills all day long. So if you translate that into the speaking world, I would rather have someone who I know is a dynamic speaker. And maybe I need them to cover a particular topic that isn't their normal topic. Well, with enough time, that dynamic speaker can do the research. They can hone in on that message and they can deliver. But I don't really think you can do it the other way around. I got a call last year. Can you speak on <laughs> recruitment and retention? Uh, that's not, not your innovative distinction. Okay. journey. <laughs> so I did creative recruitment and retention because yeah. I do creativity. There you go. Um, that's a I great way to tie that in. The first thing is, how much does it pay? <laughs> no. Um, it worked out fine, and I, I did that as a keynote, but um, yeah, uh, I tend to try to stay in my lane, but she's the one who called me and asked if you could, you know, do this. Other than they knew they wanted you, they knew the, the level of presentation that you would bring to them, and they were comfortable knowing that you would, you would do the water. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you would do the work and, and deliver a great talk. And I got sure you did. I was on LinkedIn for months. That's awesome. <laughs> love that. I love that. Learned way more than uh, I ever imagined. Um, what initially catches your attention? Is it uh, great marketing materials? Is it a flashy video? And if it is a flashy video, can you see through that? Because as somebody who comes from the TV end of it, we can put something together that looks good, but doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's a good speaker. Right. I'm, I'm still all about the relationship building. And I think, you know, there are a lot of emails that I have received from speakers that have been deleted. And some of it is that it appears to be a canned message that they're probably sending out to everyone and not specific, you know, to me. Um, but I think the relationship building is important where you're almost kind of dripping your message of, hey, doing this outreach, here's some information, should you have a need? But then knowing when to follow up on that. Following up every week is annoying. Um, but but understanding what that cadence might be for someone based on when are their programs, when are they going to be taking a look at speakers, what is it that they need, you know, what does that planner need from you? I'm a huge fan of the one pager. You know, I like having a one page document and when I can glance at the various topics and see, you know, a short description and there's a photo and everything that's right there. If I know that it's going to meet one of the conferences that I'm working on that year, then I can go save that into a speaker folder. Whereas if I'm getting a lot of information, then I'm, it's kind of gets a little bit buried. So, you know, a little, little bit of both, but definitely building relationships. Hmm. Um, can you tell me about the process, which is this mysterious thing we don't know, um, of start to finish how you find and book speakers? So I would say, you heard me mention, you know, the agenda earlier. That's, everything starts with when and where are we having the event and what is the agenda? And once we determine what we need, how many breakout sessions are we going to have? How many main stage speakers am I looking for? And then what's the content? that we're looking for. And more than likely, we kind of divide and conquer. So we look at, all right, you know what, let's have the Bureau do the research on our main stage speakers. And then we work as a team or as individuals to determine what we're going to do for the breakout sessions. And, you know, when we were in the office more and not virtual so much, you know, there was a time when I had flip chart paper on the 
backside of my door. Nobody else could see it. But when my door was closed, you know, and I had a rough agenda showing the slots there and I would just put sticky notes and the sticky note basically would have, you know, who's the speaker? What's their topic? What's their fee? Now take that same methodology and just translate it to a grid that's in, you know, Word. By putting all of that information where we can see it, it goes back to dropping the photos in. Do I have the diversity that I need? Dropping the fee in. You know, we all have a particular bucket of, you know, money that we can work with in our speaker budget. How does that translate? Can I have everybody I want, all my first string, <laughs> and within that budget? Right. And if I can't, how far off am I? And if I'm a little off, can we negotiate? Um, if I'm pretty far off, then I might have to rethink, well, I'd really like to have this speaker, but I probably need to find someone who's less expensive. And so sometimes it's a matter of just how are they fitting into the puzzle? It's like a, a, a puzzle. It really is. It really is. Um, are most speakers voted in by the dreaded committee? <laughs> no, I would. I say dreaded. I know. Because I'm just picturing like everybody's sitting around and just really and an analyzing, yeah, judging and analyzing. And uh, and that's not been the case in my world. So, you know, it's generally, you know, again, being referred or having the information or doing our own research and kind of just determining, having those conversations of, you know, what's needed and what they can deliver and then... And then getting it booked and you know if it's if it's with a bureau we're utilizing the bureau's contract if we're booking direct then we're utilizing our contract and uh and getting them booked that way there are some you know additional things that we look for that are appealing if a speaker is willing to provide a 30 or 60 second video clip uh, you know personalized message to the audience that we can push out on our social channels kind of say, hey, I'm going to be with you in, you know, Austin or Fort Worth or San Antonio or wherever, then, you know, that's a big help as well because it, it, it helps you. Promote it helps us the promote event. them and promote the event. Um, once the speaker has been secured, how can we work together, the speaker and the meeting planner, to give the audience exactly what they need and want? Yeah, I think the, the most successful have been, you know, maybe a, a two touch point system, meaning there's an intake conversation that happens on the front end so that the speaker is asking questions about the audience and, and what the, you know, goals and the mission is. And that way, before they even start working on fulfilling our needs, then they know what those needs are. And then on the back end, we will actually schedule a call with each speaker 30 days out to make sure that, you know, what do they need to know about our group or our audience? And, you know, we kind of reconfirm our setting, our setup, you know, in, in the ballroom and that sort of thing, making sure, you know, are they planning on bringing anything last minute that maybe we hadn't discussed, a handout or cards or something that might be on a table. And so I think those two touch points are, are really Im important. Um, is it my imagination or has the speaking industry changed a lot since COVID? And I don't mean just the virtual stuff, because I think, thank goodness, people are back to face-to-face. -to -face. But something is different because I've been booked a week, two weeks. I just booked something. It's two weeks away. Yeah. Two to three weeks away. Yes. Definitely <laughs> a lot of that's ever happened before. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It's a lot of uh, short-term bookings right now, and uh, not to study the at all, right? Yeah. And there are still a lot of you know conferences, if you will, based on their size, that are booking three, five, eight years out. But there are a lot of meetings that are happening, you know, more short-term. There are also organizations that are having more meetings per year than before because of the virtual aspect, because they have folks that are working remote. Now they need to have maybe a quarterly touch point in person. And so that might be where some of the internal committees, you know, the staff committees come together and somebody's in charge of putting that on. And that might be some of the, you know, okay, we've got to pick this 
topic. We've got to pick this speaker and then we've got to make this happen. And oh gosh, we don't do this every day for a living because we're not part of the events team. And so now that's where some of the last minute stuff may come in as well. If it's also a lot more local stuff. I would think so. Have a little bit to do with that. Yeah, I would think so. Um, well, this show is called Speaker Sponsor. This is how I got started doing sponsorship for TV shows. Um, so I wanted to ask your opinion on how speakers can use sponsorship to help meeting planners. Like, you know, some meeting, meeting planners may not have the budget. Or like you said, you might be running out of money and you really want the speaker. What if they had their own sponsor? Does that help you? You know, I have to tell you, Julie, when you and I talked about this originally, it was really kind of a, a novel idea and not something that I had worked with speakers on uh, or ourselves. You know, you have organizations will have sponsors to sponsor a keynote session, but that's not to offset the speaker fee per se. You yeah, know, of not what, the same as the exactly. speaker having their own sponsor. Exactly. But I do, I, I love that idea. And uh, I've actually had an opportunity after we first spoke where I was asked to speak for free. And uh, I went through the, you know, the normal things of, you know, well, okay, what would be covered? What would be paid as far as travel and and the hotel and, you know, the ability to get a, a list of attendees for marketing purposes or, or things like that. But since that time, I've actually thought about, okay, you know what? I know a vendor who would love to have a presence at this and they can sponsor me and then have some of that recognition through my presentation. So win, win for Absolutely. Everybody. Really is. Absolutely. So thank you for bringing that yeah. to my attention. <laughs> Well, um, in the introduction, I mentioned you're a certified coach, and you also have a book. I'm going to hold this up. Thank you. It is called The Pillars of Confidence, Unlock Your Success in Key Life Areas. And this is fresh and hot off the press, right? Yeah. So actually, this is the second edition, and I just uh, had the cover redone. Oh, and, uh, great. So thank you. Just got that shipment in this week. I'm glad I was, to be able to bring you one. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, just wondering if you want to um, let anyone know about, the first of all, let our viewers know how they can get in touch with you and anything else you want to talk about on the, the book and well, thank anything you. else we need to know. Great. Well, my, my email, sometimes my spelling of my name might be a little tricky, but it's Tamara, T-A-M-R-A, and last name Gaines. And so my email is Tamara at TamaraGaines.com, and my website is also TamaraGaines.com. And uh, the, the Pillars of Confidence was really kind of a, a passion project from the standpoint of I was a big sister through Big Brother's Big Sister and not being a, a parent myself and, and having my own children. I was, you know, tasked with trying to kind of figure out how do I instill confidence in this young lady who at, at the time just had none. And I had gone through kind of my own uh, journey of not having confidence. And as I started researching, ultimately I ended up by having a book out of it. And, uh, and that's what I speak on, but it's also translates well into your business journey of, you know, what are your core values and how are you talking to yourself through your inner voice? And then what's your outer brand and all of those are things that are part of the pillars of confidence and uh, and how we show up to work and how we show up in life each well, day. You have to have confidence if you're standing in front of 5,000 people. Yes, for your very first <laughs> for speaking exactly. engagement. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I give you a lot of credit. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here. And this is really, really valuable information. Speakers need to know these things. And um I, I appreciate you being here. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Julie.